So we're starting a, a new series. It's uh, called Lessons from Lewis. Um, it's, we're going to have some quotations as the book down there tells me. Uh, uh, it's qu- some quotations of C.S. Lewis, and we're going to be using those over the course of the Lenten season until Palm Sunday. So looking forward to, to, to this. This, is, this has kind of been a, a fun start. I'm, I'm ahead for once in my preaching career as far as messages go, so that's kind of like another hallelujah. Um, so this week, this week, um, turn it on, works better. <laughs> the the um, quote is, we are not metaphorically, but in very truth, a divine work of art, something that God is making and therefore something with which he will not be satisfied until it has a certain character. And that's from The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis. Um, it's a powerful statement, right? You know, he's going to be working on us. It's the second half of the masterpiece quote because, it, you know, we got works to do and he's going to continue to work on us, which, of course, took me back to the Ephesians passage. passage. If you will read this with me since we're here together again. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So we talk about God's masterpiece. What, what jumps in, in, into your mind? You think about maybe the, the, the universe, the cosmos, and how incredible it is that the more that we look and the more that we find out, we, the further we can see through technology, the more that we find that, the, that, that there is so much in this, in this universe of ours. That might be the place that you go, you know, that maybe it's the, an evening sky with the sunset painted, you know, and, and, and the millions of, of stars above it. Others might point to a majestic mountain range or, or the lake as, as is up on, up on the picture, you know, the lake that, 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 that is a mirror lake where you can look in the water and you see the, the shore. Or maybe it's the, the created, the, all of the different uh, animals and, and plant life that has been created or a rushing river or flowers. You know, when you think of God's masterpiece, a lot of things might run into your head, but none of them is the greatest of God's masterpieces. The, God's masterpiece is, is probably something, some, some, something you saw this morning. And you may not have thought of it that way. But we are God's masterpiece. When you looked in the mirror this morning, you were looking at God's greatest masterpiece, his greatest handiwork. For we are God's masterpieces. We are his handiwork, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And you may not have seen it the way that God sees it, right? When I look in the mirror, I have trouble seeing, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm the greatest thing that God has done. Ooh. <laughs> and yet, we are his masterpiece. You know, the, the world and the enemy robs us of our identity so often. And this is one of the things that, that does that. We begin to see ourselves in comparison to all kinds of others. And the next thing you know, or an impossible marker, you know, the target is, is this, especially for, you know, models. And, and is a, a model body type is not a normal body type, right, for men or women. And yet that becomes the target. And then we have issues that go with that. But what if we saw ourselves as, as the, who we're supposed to be, to be who we are, and that God made you how you are intentionally? That it's okay. That, that you aren't flawed. You know, we sin and we fall short, but we're not. We are created to do the good works. He, we are his masterpiece. This morning there's going to be uh, seven different points, um, and I'll try to iron them out. 
The first one has to do with the fact that we are God's masterpiece and workmanship. The rest of them are going to point to um, kind of what do we do with that. See, it's God alone who makes Christians. You don't get to make yourself a Christian. God, makes, uh, God is the one who makes, makes us who we are. We are the, the masterpieces of God. Does the painting paint itself? No, it can't. Does the song write itself? No, does, does the symphony compose itself? Does, does, does the poem write it? No, none of those things do themselves, that, nor do we do anything that contributes to our salvation. Ours, ours is a yes, and then a transformation comes out of that. Jonah 2.9, but I with shouts of grateful praise will sacrifice to you, and I will fulfill all my vows for my salvation comes from the Lord alone, or Isaiah 64, 8, yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. I love that, that mental image. We all are formed by your hand, or as I wrote, read earlier, God saved, for by grace you have been saved when you believed, and you can't take credit for it. It's a gift. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done, so none of us get to boast about that. There are blessings that come from some of the things that we do, but not salvation. It's by grace, grace alone. It can only be received. See, salvation is a gift to be received. It's not a goal to be achieved. That's a challenge for us in, in, the, in America, right? It's like, let me target this. I'm going to go get that. But it's through faith alone. Christ saves us when we receive the gift of salvation that's offered to all. We are his masterpiece. You're going to hear that a lot. We are his masterpiece. I, I, when you get up in the morning, I challenge you when you get ready for work or you get ready to go out in your day, the first time you look in the mirror, I want to say this, I am God's masterpiece. Look yourself in the eye and do it. Watch the transformation that comes over the course of time as you begin to, you know, at first you, you'll be going like, I'm God's masterpiece. But when you can get there to go, I, I am God's masterpiece, and look yourself in the eye, that will be a moment of transformation for you that will be incredible. It will change how you view yourself. It will change how you interact and view others. And it will probably be one of the ch most challenging things that you ever do. So that's my challenge. This week, try it. Try it for two weeks. If it doesn't work, what have you lost? For I am God's masterpiece. Second Corinthians 5.17. I dare you to do that. I, yeah, let me drop back. <laughs> I dare you to do that. I challenge you to do that. The world robs us of our identity. We have to get it back. This is 2021. Our whole focus right now is, okay, 2020 happened, and now we're going forward. We're gonna, we're, what are we going to do, Harold? We're going to go forward. We're going to press on. Press on, that's right. We're going to be pressing on. You can go watch a video of, of Harold in the, in the worship service on, on Facebook, dancing and saying we're going to press on. Has more. <laughs> He's pressing on because Betty's pushing it. Well, maybe so, but, but that video of you ha has, has been seen more than, you know, I don't even know how many. Was it up to 500 views or something like that? You know, so... Yet the joy of the Lord, transforming a heart and a life and seeing it come to life. I dare you, I dare you to look in the mirror in the morning when you get up and say, I am God's masterpiece, created to do good works. You do that, and let's see what happens. I'm, I'm excited about it. I don't even want to preach anymore. Because <laughs> if we can do that, man. Anyone that, that, who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. It transitions, right? Because if we can do, and that fits, because if we can get in our head who we really are, we are a new creation. I am not that junk or whatever my head is telling me. I am a masterpiece created by God himself to do good works. If I can do that, I become a new creation. We are God's greatest handiwork, and, 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 and part of that is because look at what he had to work with, right? <laughs> when God created the universe, he made us out of, or made it out of nothing, right? When God makes Christians new creation, he makes us out of nothing. We are nothing apart from God's grace. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, but God takes sinners. You know what he does to them? What is the opening to almost all of Paul's letters? To the saints 
at Ephesus to the saints in Corinth. He takes sinners, you know what he turns them into? Saints. See, this is the new creation. Yeah, you were a sinner, but you know what you are now? You're a saint. You are a masterpiece. You're incredible. Live into that. That's, it's just it's beyond comprehension. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, but God takes sinners and he turns them into saints. You are God's masterpiece. Point number one. Number two is that God's work on us is great because of what it cost him. It cost him. See, God's original creation, you know what it cost him? Nothing. Didn't cost him any time because God dwells outside of time. Didn't cost him any energy because God never tires. You know what it cost him for us to become a new creation? It cost him his son. The blood of his own son. During World War II, there was a custom in the United States for a family who had a son serving in the military to place a star in the front window. But a gold star indicated that the son had died in support of the country's cause. One night, a man was walking down New York City Street accompanied by his five-year-old son. The little, the little boy wanted to know why some of the houses had that star in the window. And the father explained that that meant that their families had a son fighting in the war, and the child would clap his hands as he saw another star in the window and would cry out, Look, Daddy, there's another family who gave a son for their country. And at last they came to an empty lot, and there was a break in the row of houses, and through the gap in the houses he could see a star shining brightly in the sky. And the little boy caught his breath and said, Oh, Daddy, look at the star of the window of heaven. God must have given his son to. There's a star in God's window. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Our God is a God of salvation. He would that all would be saved. And so when I, when I said that we are God's masterpieces, I didn't mean we're the kind that you put on a wall, right? Oh, and it, people gawk at. You know, the, what is it, the Mona Lisa? Or, you know, we're, not, we're not that kind of masterpiece. We are made to serve. We are God's workers. Our good works prove the reality of our faith. And now I'm going to say some things, and I want you to listen closely because people get this messed up. See, we are not saved by works. We are not saved by works. We are saved for works. We are not saved by what we do. We are saved so that we can do good works. We do not do, we, we don't work in order to be saved. We work because we are saved, right? That's the way it works. Not saved by works, but a saved person works, it's an important distinction. James, in his letter, makes it very clear. He says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, hope that you have a good, uh, to, get, to eat well, but you don't give him anything. What good does that do? See, James doesn't mean that we're saved by faith plus works. He means that that works are the result of our salvation. The person that James talks about doesn't have genuine faith. He has an intellectual kind of faith, a faith that's really dead and useless. It's a, I go to church every Sunday and I don't do anything else, you know? I, 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 I like to, to go, go and hang out with people, but it doesn't impact my life. You know, around here we talk about be you for him. And that means to be who you are, not, not to be randomly, you know, not to be <laughs> abrasive or, or, you know, abusive or anything, not to be, you know, that's not who you are created to be. You're created to be a child of God. Be who you are for his glory. That's what we are created to do. And here's a scary passage of scripture. You want to read that with me? 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Let that settle. You know? James, don't just listen to God's word. You have to do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. And this isn't about doing it perfect, but this is about living the life. Our, the fruit of the Spirit identify the life of a Christian, you know, that, that fruit that, that Galatians talks about. Those who think that they can be a Christian without doing anything for the Lord are deceiving themselves. It's not possible. If you are saved, if you have encountered the living God, you will be changed. You will not want to do all of those things that you used to do. You are going to begin to do other things, and it's a path. It's a journey, the road, you know, and Jesus said the road narrows, you know, over time. Thankfully, you know, it starts out really wide because it's like, I don't know how to do this Christian life thing, so I start learning how. And as I learn more and more, the road does narrow. Things that were okay then are not okay now. But we were created to do good works. And we don't do good works to be saved. We do good works because we are saved. That's a huge distinction. Faith without works is dead. And this isn't about judging other people, too. Some folks go, well, I'm looking at your life, and I don't see your works. Well, I'm sorry, but God is the one who's going to be the judger of an eternity for anybody. But we can look at one, we can hold each other up to when we're faltering and lovingly correct one another. That's why we need each other. You know, we have blind spots. Our good works bring glory to God. Some people do good works because they might want that praise for themselves. Some might say, wow, look at him or her. That's not why we do. That's not the reason behind it. If you're questioning, do the good works. Well, I don't know if I'm doing this for myself or if I'm doing this for God. Do it anyway. You know, take, take, the, take a shot at it. You know, because that will clarify over time. But that's not our primary motivation for doing good works. Our ultimate purpose in this life is to bring glory to the, to the creator of all, to our God. He saved us, so we bring glory to him. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Or even Jesus said, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all the sea so that everyone will praise your Father who is in heaven. God isn't glorified by lazy Christians. God is glorified by active Christians. That's the way that this works. You know, what we do matters. At the end of the creation account, it says that then God looked, oh, God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And I wonder, I wonder sometimes when God looks at me or when God, you might you know, evaluate, when God looks at us, what does he say? Does he say very good? Or does he say something else? God poured his grace upon us so that we might be able to live into the life that Jesus points us towards. Shouldn't we bring more praise to his name? Brother Lawrence, you know, I'm um, going to talk about him a little bit this week. I'm going to talk about him a lot next week. Uh, practicing the presence of God is the, it, it was his, his book. Actually, he didn't write it. It was written after he passed away. It was put together from some of his writings. Practicing the presence of God. Because you, you're not going to get the presence of God by osmosis. It's going to have to be intentional. You have to set the time aside. You have to prioritize it in your life or it won't happen. It's not just going to... Float in and, and go, oh, okay, I get it all now. You have to intentionally work towards God. It's up to us. And guess what? Good works might just have a tremendous impact on people. I, I just mentioned that. I didn't mean to throw you, throw you out there, Harold, but I just, it just dawned on me. I hadn't really thought of it this way. That means that five, at least 500 people have watched that video of you dancing to the Lord and saying, press on. Do you know how many people that's going to impact over time? And you were just dancing, I know. <laughs> you just worship. In the moment, allowing God to move our hearts, allowing God to work within us, man, who knows what impact that's going to have? Who knows? Uh, Louis Pasteur was a, he was a pioneer of immunology, lived at a time when thousands of people died each year of rabies. 
and he worked for years on a vaccine, just as he was about to start experimenting on himself. A nine-year-old boy named Joseph Meister was bitten by a rabid dog, and the boy's mother begged Pasteur to experiment on her son because he, he, you know, he was in trouble. So Pasteur injected Joseph for 10 days, and the boy lived. Decades later, of all the things that pa pasteurization, I mean, he, this is, this is a, 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 a biggie in, in, the, in science. All of the things that Pasteur could have had etched on his tombstone, he asked for three words. Joseph Meister lived. Joseph Meister lived. And you might be thinking, I could never have a big impact on someone's life. Who am I to do something great? What are you going to say in the morning when you look in the mirror? That's right. That's who you are. But in case you're wondering, there's been a few folks that didn't think that they were worthwhile either. God took a stick in the hand of Moses. You know what he did with it? He parted the Red Sea. Took a slingshot in the hand of a boy and killed the towering giant. God took a little boy's lunch and fed thousands. What can God do with the little that you have to offer him? Little is much when God is in it. God created you to do amazing things. Don't think you're doing little by teaching a Sunday school class or a Bible study or a men's group. Don't think you're doing little by praying for your neighbor or your friend or others. Don't think you're doing little by calling on the sick or the hurting. You might never see the effect that you're having on others. But there might be a life touched so deeply so that on your tombstone it will be written, my neighbor lived. Or that little girl in Sunday school lived. A precious soul was rescued from hell and is in heaven because you showed up and you followed what God asked you to do. See, working for God is an honor, not a bother. I love this. This is a Sir Christopher Wren with the famous English architect. He was directing the building of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and some of the workers got interviewed by a journalist who asked him, what are you doing here? The first said, I'm cutting stone for three shillings a day. The second replied, I'm putting 10 hours a day in on this job. And the third replied, I'm helping Sir Christopher Wren build the greatest cathedral in Great Britain to the glory of God. I like that. I'm helping him build to the glory of God. What if all we do, we do as unto the Lord? When you think about serving God, don't think of it as something you should do, but rather what would rather not do. Don't think of it as a duty or a chore. Instead, think of it as the honor that it really is. And I know we got a lot of political upheaval, but let me tell you what. I bet that if the president called you and said, I would like you to do this, you would have a sense of honor that the president of the United States would call you and ask you to do something. How then should we feel that the creator of all that there is has created us to do good works. Too many Christians sit on the sidelines. Working for God is a command. It's not an option. The streets were lined with crowds cheering the marching soldiers about to leave for overseas. A recruit who'd watched the crowd for some time said, who are all those people cheering? And the veteran replied, uh, they're the people who aren't going. Too many Christians are sitting in the pews or the chairs, cheering on the few who are doing most of the work. 2080 principle, has anybody heard of that? 20% of the people do 80% of the work. What if we were a church that flipped that on its head? What if 80% of the people did 80% of the work? What if, I, what if we were engaged in such a way? That to see us was to see God. Too many of us need to get in the game. We need less spectators. 
more servants. Certain good works have been planned for us by God's Spirit. We, got, we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God has a blueprint for your life. Before the creation of this world, God had a plan for you to do certain good works. The question is, are you doing them? Are you doing Are you even trying to figure out what they are? What, you know, what does it look like? And here's the thing. The time for those works, you know when it is? Today, today, Jesus declared, do you not say there are still four months and then the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the field, for they are already white for harvest. So don't, don't think I'll start serving the Lord tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. We know that's not guaranteed. James, the time to begin is now. It is today to him who knows to do good and does not do it. To him it is sin. When we know what we ought to do and we don't do it, that is sin. Refusal to work brings devastating consequences. A minister was approached by a man who wanted to join a church. But the man said, now, I have a very busy schedule. I can't be called upon for any service or any cleaning or teaching or singing in the choir. I just won't be available for special projects or to help with setting up chairs or things like that. And I'm afraid I'll never be able to help out with the youth activities as my evenings are all tied up. And the minister thought for a moment and then he replied, I believe you're at the wrong church. The church that you're looking for is three blocks down the street on the right. The man followed the preacher's directions and soon came to an abandoned, boarded up, closed church building. What if Noah had decided it was too much work to build the ark? Might be no life on the planet. What if Moses had refused to lead the Israelites out of Egypt? Might they have not entered the promised land? What if Paul disobeyed God's call to preach the gospel to us, Gentiles? Might still be in darkness. And what if you don't do the work God has planned for you to do? You are gifted. You are made for good works. What will it mean if we don't do them? What will it mean for our church? What does it mean for our family? What does it mean for our community, our neighbors? What will it mean for your life? God said, oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my path. Is God saying these same things? Is he, does he cry, oh, that Mike Devine would listen to me. Oh, that he would walk in my path. See, because we are not metaphorically, but in very truth, a divine work of art. Something that God is making. And therefore, something with which he will not be satisfied until it has a certain character. You are created to be who you are. You are gifted in the way that you are gifted, and it's not an accident. You're gifted in that way so that you can do the good works that are planned for you. When you say yes to God, you're giving God permission to work in your life, and that, that would not happen otherwise, and stir the pot some, so you're going to get some conviction and some movement and some uncomfortability. It's a holy discontent. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It's telling. It, it means I'm not in the place that I'm supposed to be. I got to keep looking at this. But you are God's workmanship. You are God's masterpiece. Bonnie, who are you? You are God's masterpiece. Tammy, God's, isn't that amazing that you were created to do good works? And this life, this place, the place of refinement, we get refined over time as we journey together with Jesus and the Holy Spirit will continue to refine us. Each of us is a lifelong project. But our artist... Our artist is the very, very best, the very, very best there has ever been. So trust him as he molds you into the shape and the place you were created for. If you'll bow with me. Father, you created each of us in this place to be specifically who we are, but to do so for the glory of you. You created us to bring glory to you. Take away those things that get between us and you. Bring us closer into relationship with you. Lord, we know that you created us for this. Help us to walk into it. Give us courage. Give us the ability to not give up. Help us to see clearly, to walk boldly, and to be the men and women that you created us 
to be 